Welcome to CoinGeek Conversations, and I'm very pleased to be joined this week by Zach Resnick, who is the managing partner at Unbounded Capital. Zach, good afternoon. Thanks for having me today, Charles. Well, thank you for doing this. You're listening to CoinGeek Conversations with Charles Miller. We are at the CoinGeek Conference in Zurich, and you are about to take part in a panel discussing the environment and Bitcoin, which is a big topic these days. What's your line going to be in this discussion? We would argue that Bitcoin is perhaps one of the most eco-friendly technologies ever created. So how do we get to that point of view? Uh, This is a topic that a lot of investors have been thinking about, speaking about amongst themselves, publishing views on. Notably, this started earlier this year with the Stone Ridge uh, annual shareholder letter. They make a few claims, including that you know Bitcoin is a positive force for the world and kind of the things you've heard before around monetary policy and how having an alternative to fiat currency is, is good. But then they talk about uh, the environmental implications of Bitcoin and how having a proof of work hash generating uh, network incentivizes renewable energy and you see renewable energy springing up kind of all around the world to mine Bitcoin because you don't have to actually connect to this like any type of centralized grid. Yeah, so by not connecting to a centralized grid, you don't have to worry about distribution and the problem with renewable energy has never really been a question of generation. It's always been on distribution and how easy it is to store and transmit that energy. So with Bitcoin, given uh, you could just put all of your additional power towards mining Bitcoin, you don't have that issue. So you can start up a a mining operation with 100% renewable energy anywhere really far from any grid and still be able to utilize all that energy efficiently. And so is it your position then that this whole worry about Bitcoin mining uses as much energy as, you know, any small country you can think of, that you would dispute that? Well, I just think the, the question is, a little misguided and perhaps not coming with good or you know honest intentions, where I think when you're looking at the environmental effects of something, you can't look at that in isolation. You have to look at, okay, what is the total you know positive benefits, negative benefits of any type of thing in society? And I think looking at the environmental effects of that is definitely important, but you have to say, okay, what is the cost of this? And there are lots of things in this world that take up significantly more power than you know mining BTC Bitcoin today. Uh, but a lot of people would argue that the benefits vastly outweigh the environmental cost and that long term it will actually uh, be responsible for using less energy. I don't feel that way about the BTC version of Bitcoin, but I, I do think that the Bitcoin SV version of Bitcoin uh, is a wildly more efficient transaction processing. So depending on what day you're looking at, it's somewhere between about 10,000 and 100,000 times as efficient as BTC Bitcoin. So for the same cost and for the same amount of power, you could put you know, 10,000, 50,000 transactions in a block for the cost and the power of you know, one transaction on BTC Bitcoin. So it's that much more environmentally friendly. And then you could kind of take that argument and look at um, you know, the visa networks and other transaction processing networks and say, okay, what is the total net cost of processing this transaction? And there's going to be, you know, fairly strong, not exact, but strong correlation between what it costs to process a transaction and the environmental cost of that. So if you have a more efficient way of processing transaction, a more efficient way of processing payments, uh, you know, everyone here at the conference, I think, understands at least on some level that this represents the possibility of kind of a more efficient internet, a more efficient database than we've ever seen in the world today. And I think that greater efficiency uh, leads to greater efficiency in terms of power usage and consumption. And uh, I think our point of view is that uh, as BSV gets more efficient, it's going to wildly surpass Visa in its transaction processing capacity, which will make it much cheaper and have less power per transaction compared to Visa. I also think that the kind of services on top of that transaction processing network are likely to be a lot more efficient and a lot more environmentally friendly on kind of what the you know new newer economy and newer fintech companies look like that are built on Bitcoin rather than the interbanking partners of Visa, for example. Well, let's turn to your sort of business background and uh, your work at Unbounded Capital. 
And part of that is talking to outside businesses, I think, and people about BSV and what it can do. Is this a subject that crops up quite a bit? Definitely as of late. Uh, when the Stone Ridge letter came out earlier this year, I had many of my existing investors reach out. I had many you know, people send that to our investors. I had many people reach out to us, what's your opinion on this? And then since Elon has started talking about all of this, the degree to which people have been uh, asking me, asking the firm about this has really increased, which is what led us to, we're actually working on our second ebook on this topic right now. Uh, we put on a webinar on the topic a couple of months ago and something worth thinking about a lot. And what we're excited about is the fact that pretty much every investor, whether they have an allocation to crypto or blockchain, even if they're not considering it, almost every serious professional investor has meaningfully thought about this topic as it's just been in the news so much it's been spoken about in investor circles. Um, so I think it's a great way for people to understand kind of the efficiency and opportunity of Bitcoin SV, both within kind of what it can do for the environment as well as everything else. Right. And so let's talk more broadly about, about your work uh, with Unbounded. Can you just give me a, a picture of where you've got to with that? Yeah, so Unbounded Capital is a firm that's investing into the Bitcoin SV ecosystem. And uh, we spend most of our time and energy uh, investing in and supporting uh, what we view as some of the top entrepreneurs and companies that are building on top of the Bitcoin SV version of, of, of Bitcoin. So our ambitions are to continue to grow rapidly along with the ecosystem and to continue funding great entrepreneurs and eventually move not to from solely the early stage where we are today, but to funding companies kind of at every uh, stage of the life cycle. And we're really excited about what we're seeing in the space today and uh, feel very grateful to you know, be here today at CoinGeek and to be you know, meeting so many of the entrepreneurs we've been watching or speaking with virtually and getting to meet them in person. Well, I've had the pleasure of uh, speaking already to two of your partners, Jackson Lasky and yeah. Dave Mullenmore. And would it be fair to say that this is a partnership that arose out of a friendship and mutual interests as well? Definitely, yeah. Jack is one of my best friends and we've been uh, you know, working together and have been friends for nearly a decade now. And friends in, in relation to some particular interests? Yeah, so we both went to school uh, for music. We went to Oberlin Conservatory in Ohio and uh, we met playing jazz together. Uh, he's a pianist, I'm a trumpet player, um, and that's how we got to initially know one another. But our friendship and our kind of working relationship really bonded as we started studying poker together, uh, playing poker together, and then eventually launching a poker podcast, which turned into a you know, poker content, events, and coaching business. Uh, it's interesting because is there a connection between musicians and poker? I mean, um, or was that just a, an unusual kind of coincidence that the two of you overlap on both things? To me, especially with jazz music, there's a really strong connection as these are all just different vehicles for uh, kind of forcing yourself to be honest with yourself and to be present and to push yourself. So with something like jazz, uh, but even any type of music, it's, it's hard to be that dishonest with yourself when you're playing, you're recording, you're hearing yourself, you're getting feedback. You really have to kind of just do the work and show up and it's difficult to hide. Well, I was thinking maybe you were talking more like if, if, if you're talking about improvisation, you have to make split second decisions yeah. and you have to decide whether to take a risk yeah. and something may go wrong, but maybe it's worth trying. Yeah, definitely also that. And I would say, you know, in general, kind of the, the stakes are the stakes are higher and the presence and discipline required to improvise is much higher than kind of not improvising, for example, yeah. like with, with poker, you have to make quickish decisions and you know the kind of the, the more quick the decision the more analogous it is to say jazz music where you're constantly kind of playing deciding. And, and in both cases you're uh, not sure whether you're going to be sort of celebrated or ridiculed for what you just did I guess. <laughs> well now that I'm you know running a BSV ecosystem fund uh, I, I can say that uh, all the ridicule I experienced as a poker player or a musician has not compared to what we've experienced uh, now but for what it's worth, I think for both Jack and myself, we kind of feed off that, and uh, you know, uh, our we walk our own paths. That's kind of how we've always lived our lives, and I, I think that lends itself towards finding uh, you know asymmetric bets uh, in the world of investing. Right, and as you go around being ridiculed, 
with your idea about uh, being venture capital in and the BSV world. Yeah. Is that lessening as the months and the years go on, do you think? Is well, the message getting across? Well, I don't, I don't think the degree of, say, ridicule is lessening that much. It's definitely lessening a little bit. It's more that there's just way more people who kind of see the value in this. And, you know, at the beginning where it's, you know, we're not managing a ton of money and I'm, you know, trying to get introductions to investors and working really hard kind of uphill, very few people are reaching out to us. Now that's kind of shifted where I'm having lots of conversations with investors that are directly reaching out to us. They've already read our book. They've already kind of checked out the landscape. I definitely spend my time less with people that kind of are ridiculing the, the space. Uh, it doesn't mean that ridicule is not out there though. Uh, and then I think anyone that, you know, has a lengthy conversation with me or kind of give, give some time to actually understand this and comes in with an open mind, it's very rare that I would kind of were to receive ridicule as a result of that is, you know, I think you and most people here are aware is like a lot of the ridicule is, is more based on, I'd say, kind of a cursory understanding of uh, what this space is or who the people well, or are. Or some are. completely different agenda that... Uh, yes, yeah. I mean, as I understand the venture capital business, you've got sort of two sides to it. One is you go around in the big wide world persuading people to entrust them, entrust you with their money. And the other side is you go around in the in the entrepreneurial world and try and make good use of it to to make it work. Is that sort of a summary of? Yeah, those, um, are, the, those are the two main things. Well, so let's talk a little bit about the the distribution of the money that's invested then. Yeah. What is your feeling about the opportunities out there? Do you find lots of good opportunities to invest or is it a needle in a haystack? Uh, right now, we're very much constrained by capital, not by opportunities. There's a ton of incredible entrepreneurs, both the entrepreneurs that we've invested in, where you know we've maybe invested a year, a year and a half, two years ago, and they've grown so much that they're maybe at a stage where they're looking for additional funding, as well as you know some of the entrepreneurs here at CoinGeek that we haven't invested in but are doing incredible things, and then entrepreneurs around the world that are building on Bitcoin and aren't say involved in the BSV ecosystem but are you know reaching out to us and. Uh, having some conversations there. So there's definitely no shortage of incredible opportunities. Uh, and you know, we've personally helped entrepreneurs move from Hyperledger, or Ethereum, and other uh, blockchains or things masquerading as blockchains over to Bitcoin SV. And I don't see that trend uh, stopping anytime soon. Are there companies where you can see, I'm going to put some money into this and the money's going to start flowing in straight away and it'll grow massively? Like, you know, in those, those classic dot-com startups where yeah. a little bit of money and suddenly, whoomp, the whole thing takes off. Well, so typically, and I would say this is also the case uh, within BSV, although a bit less so, companies that generate a lot of cash at the beginning are generally not the companies that become, you know, huge venture-scaled uh, companies, just like in the dot-com era. The vast majority of venture returns were not driven by companies making lots of cash from the beginning. They were on growing their user base and growing an asset which like they were not monetizing at the beginning. Uh, what's actually, I think, quite unique about Bitcoin is that you have a much higher percentage of companies that are generating revenue, that are generating some gross profit from the beginning. Can you give me an example of, of, of one of those companies that is sort of profitable even at the early stage? Well, profitable and making money or making gross profit are two different things. I think as a, as a venture capitalist, um, I'm, I'm typically never going to want a company to be profitable at the early stage because it means that they're not investing enough into growth. Um, typically in venture capital, uh, you're not going to be wanting to come close to profitability until you're making you know, tens of millions in revenue and oftentimes could hundreds of millions or billions. Uh, you know, we saw this year um, you know, Uber went from losing billions uh, every quarter to uh, now, you know, just losing a small hundreds of, amount, hundreds of millions and it looks like at the end of the year they're actually going to be profitable. So, um, All right, let me, the, let me rephrase yeah. that. A company that is generating impressive sales revenue at least. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of our portfolio companies, Hand Cash, that a lot of people watching this video I'm sure will know, um, they have now tons of users that are, you know, playing games that are connected to Hand Cash. Uh, you have lots of businesses that have built um, using the Hand Cash Connect SDK. And uh, you know, they're monetizing that 
in some ways today, but I think they're kind of a good example of a company that's looking uh, for the future where you know, they, they definitely could be making a lot more money today than they are, but they're trying to grow. Uh, the user base are trying to get the product in more people's hands, are trying to improve the product, rather than trying to say, you know, maximize revenue or profit from the beginning, which is definitely the, the strategy and what's kind of in line if you know, a, com- a company's gonna be taking venture capital investment. If, if somebody comes along to unbounded capital as a, an entrepreneur with a business idea, what are the characteristics that are going to really attract you to them and what, what might put you off? Um, so we mainly invest in two different buckets. There's what we call Bitcoin infrastructure companies. So these are companies that make it easier for other people to unlock the incredible technology of Bitcoin without having to understand it themselves. You know, Run Brenton's company is a great example of this where you know no one has to learn the Turing Complete smart contracting Bitcoin scripting language. Uh, you just can code with JavaScript using Run, uh, and that's why it's you know one of the most popular tokenization and smart contracting platforms on you know Bitcoin today. Um, so that's I think a great example of a company that you know lots of people will will use that um, that don't even really understand how Bitcoin works, and that's okay. They're just taking advantage of of, uh, of the technology and what it can do, and that's I'd say where a majority of our capital to date has gone because that's also where we think at kind of the life cycle of the ecosystem, we think presents a great kind of risk return, uh, especially because we think there's very few investors that can really evaluate those risks at this stage as well. So it's easier for us to kind of look at the different companies and and really help them out uh, without the kind of competition that's endemic in uh, the, I'd say the rest of the venture capital world today. Uh, But we also love companies that uh, are pioneering new business models that aren't possible without Bitcoin and building amazing things. And I think a, a great example of this is a company that we recently invested in, uh, TDXP. And uh, you know they're one of the fastest growing derivatives exchanges in the world. They've grown tremendously since launching last November. And they're only able to do what they do and offer the features that they can do and make decent gross profit at pretty early stage as a result of taking advantage of Bitcoin. So those are two examples that kind of fit the two different buckets that we invest in. And I view over time, over the coming years and decade, it becoming a higher percentage of more of the amazing applications and businesses built on Bitcoin that aren't possible without it, rather than say infrastructure companies. But for now, we definitely invest more in infrastructure companies than not. And I'd say really any ambitious entrepreneur that's building on Bitcoin, uh, we're very excited to connect with and you know learn more. Right. Yeah, I mean, TDXP is a great example of a business that takes advantage of the special features of Bitcoin SV, isn't it? I've used it and you can buy and sell shares in recognized companies for, you know, one penny or something. Yeah. And, and, I mean, I can see that that the sort of USP of Bitcoin SV is is something that, if it, you know, in your shoes, I would guess, would be one of the main points when you're evaluating things. Yeah, it's just a matter of focus. You know, there's the cost of focus is you turn down a ton of amazing companies. As someone who's connected to, you know, venture and entrepreneurial communities, uh, crypto, blockchain, and otherwise, I see a lot of great companies uh, that are not, you know, building on BSV that are not a blockchain companies. Uh, that I maybe would love to invest in, I think are great investments, but I don't spend the time there so I could have my time and focus be on investing and supporting the entrepreneurs building on Bitcoin. So you're right, the answer is it it does need to be the special thing that's only really possible with Bitcoin. And that's because, again, I'm I'm constrained by capital right now. There is no shortage of great companies being built on Bitcoin. So as long as that's the case, I'm going to continue raising money for that. I'm going to continue focusing on supporting those entrepreneurs. Bitcoin SV is a technology as well as a business opportunity. When you're evaluating a team that comes, I'm guessing that perhaps the the business end of it is not as strong sometimes as the technical side, or is that wrong? It really varies. Uh, you know, for the more Bitcoin infrastructure type companies, yeah, I think definitely it's going to be stronger engineers, developers, and maybe. Uh, the weaknesses are more on, say, like sales or networking and things. But ultimately, that's, I think, uh, a good fit for the type of investing we do, where, uh, you know, myself, my partners, Mike Hennessy, Dave Mullenmore, Jack, Jack Lasky, we're able to help on, you know, growing these businesses, helping out with sales, with, 
you know, of course, Jack is a you know CEO of a software company himself and a developer, uh, but you know I think our sweet spot has been finding really smart product-driven entrepreneurs, those that have created great products that have a vision for a fantastic product, and helping them more so on the business side. There's definitely been uh, some entrepreneurs that are a bit more balanced, um, but that the the kind of product-focused entrepreneur has been the majority of what we've been investing in today. And a lot of venture capitalists say it's the people rather than the idea. Yeah. Is that, do you feel that? I mean, it's, you have to look at everything and there's, there's lots of venture capitalists that are, you know, thesis driven, that are market driven. You have to evaluate the people, of course, as, as well, but it's all a matter of how that fits into the mental model. And I would say at Unbounded, the people we invest in are very important. It's, you know, the average startup investment lasts longer than the average marriage. Uh, so you're really entering into a long relationship with whoever you invest in. So for us, you know, we uh, we have a rule of both anyone that's working at the firm as well as that we invest in, which is you know this has to be someone that we'd want to have over for dinner uh, if you know we're going to be working with them and for the coming years. Uh, so does that requirement for good communication between you and the and the people you're investing in does that tend to mean they're American rather than from other parts of the world? No, we've invested globally. You know, we, we've invested in Norway, we've invested in Spain, we've invested in India. You know, we, we, part of what we like to do at Unbounded is help entrepreneurs from around the world uh, enter uh, and hopefully in the future dominate, you know, the U.S. market. Uh, so we've definitely invested in American entrepreneurs and American companies, but we have invested in more uh, companies outside the U.S. than within the U.S. And we anticipate for that to continue. Right. Okay. We, we should probably end in a minute. But if uh, if somebody has an idea, would you welcome an approach? And what would your tips be for them to make a successful approach to Unbounded? Definitely. So we have a, a forum on our website, Unbounded Capital, where entrepreneurs can kind of share their ideas with us. And what I would say is, I wouldn't so much worry about you know the approach. I'd worry about the business itself. Uh, and in general, you know, there's been a lot of people smarter than me with more experience than myself that have discussed how to do a good pitch deck, how to do a good cold email. Google those things, read those things before you contact, uh, because you know, good ideas are a dime a dozen, but being able to communicate those effectively and be able to sell that to people. You, know, you might be starting by primarily thinking you need to sell that to investors, but really uh, you need to be selling all the time to you know, your future employees, to your customers, to future investors, and taking the time to really communicate something effectively is not just something you have to do to raise money, it's something that's an essential part of, you know, growing and scaling a business. And do you want to see businesses, I mean, obviously, ideally, you want to see businesses that are already running, demonstrating success, or can somebody come to you with just a brilliant idea? It, it really depends. We've definitely invested in companies that are not too much more than an idea, and we've also invested in companies that are generating revenue. Uh, we like to be the first check into companies and helping them really at that early stage. Um, so yeah, that could be just a little bit more than an idea. It could also be revenue generating. Uh, you know please contact us. We're definitely open to, uh, you know, all, all forms of, yeah, all forms of company stage. And even if it's, say, you know, really early and it's not a fit for us now, we, we definitely rather get the dialogue started, see if there's ways that we're able to help, even if it doesn't make sense for us to, you know, invest at this time. Brilliant. Well, I hope you got a lot of great ideas. <laughs> and uh, anyone sending in a great idea, please, uh, Tell Zach that you got the idea from watching this podcast. That would be fantastic. But thank you very much, Zach. It's been great talking to you. Thanks for having me today. Thanks very much to Zach Resnick of Unbounded Capital. Next week, we're going to be hearing about a practical use of tokens on Bitcoin SV. It's the idea of the owner of a German construction business Dr. Maximilian Korkmaz. So please join me, Charles Miller, next week to find out about how BSV is helping his business with its cash flow and to attract new customers. Thanks for listening. Until then, goodbye. Reimagine the world's financial system, one built on being simple and fair 
not one that's overcomplicated, outdated, and broken, and keeps a quarter of the world's population from accessing it. Reimagine your own finances. Do you have full visibility and control of your assets and investments? We believe there's a better way, a new future for financial services, one built on equal opportunity, where possibilities are limitless, not limited, and everyone can live the life to which they aspire. At Fabric, we're weaving a better future of finance for the billions locked out and the billions locked in, a safe, open and fully transparent financial ecosystem built on innovative technology where anyone can transform, hold, trade and grow their assets all in one accessible place. But this journey isn't ours to take alone. Are you ready to join in? To reimagine a better future with us? Where everything is digital and anything is possible. Fabric. Reimagine prosperity.